applications of deep neural networks. This is the fall 2025 semester at Washington University. This semester, we're going to take a look at deep learning using PyTorch, and we're going to go through a, really this entire syllabus. We're going to see how to use PyTorch for just regular predictive analytics, like you probably would be better off using gradient boosting for tabular data. Then we get into convolution neural networks and computer vision. This is where deep learning really, really shines. We'll see how we can use pre-built neural networks that are already trained for a variety of things, as well as building our own neural networks. We'll take a little bit of a look at ChatGPT and large language models, though I've got an entirely separate course that focuses completely on that very vibrant topic right now. We'll see how to use image generative models so that you can create artwork and other things like that. A big part of this course is the Kaggle competition. I create a whole new data set each semester and I let students compete on this and we'll, we'll see who gets the top performing model. Facial recognition is an area of research of mine. I deal a lot with a program called Dynaface that is open source that is used by medical doctors for research into facial paralysis and we'll we'll see more about that as we as we get into how to find these facial landmarks time series is always important for predicting natural language processing neural networks have actually dominated this area reinforcement learning teaching it to do things kind of in a game sort of mode and then we'll look at deployment and monitoring and we'll get into Kaggle presentations from some of the top teams. Okay, you'll notice that the whole, all of the material for this course is on GitHub. And if you're taking this through Washington University and not just watching the, the videos, you'll also have it on Canvas, which is WashU's learning management system. Let's go just to the very first notebook. These are all Jupyter notebooks. And all of the notebooks that you have here, you'll see this little icon at the top that I have placed here. This is open in Colab. When you open it in Colab, you suddenly have a whole lot more capabilities that you did not have when you were using just GitHub. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on that just a little so that we use all the wonderful space. So origins of deep learning, these are pretty much the, I don't know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse of deep learning, not that deep learning is an apocalypse. Jan LeKern, Jeffrey Hinton. Jeffrey Hinton won a Turing Prize as well as a Nobel Prize for his work on this. Uh, the, three, the three on the left won the Turing Prize, so I guess dark shirts help. Ashwa Bengio, and then um, Andrew Ning. All of these, I have watched videos and very, very influential people in the, the field of deep learning, the original, the original creators of this. So if you look at sort of traditional software development, you would have input data, you would have program code, you would write the program code to process the input data, and then the whole thing would go into a computer and you get the output. I've been at this for, well, probably 25 years, as starting as a software engineer. This is first part of my career. This is very much was my bread and butter. I would write this computer code to process it and get the output. No help from AI at all. Machine learning now flips this a little bit on the side. You have input data, output data. And the output data, you want to have that ahead of time. So I work in the insurance industry at RGA, uh, Fortune 200-ish uh, reinsurance company, so big, big financial company. And we will have a lot of policy data on people who are applying for life insurance, and we have outcomes of how each of those policies went. Did they die before we thought they were going to die, which is never good for a life insurance company. So we take that output, the experience as we call it, and targets as it's often called in machine learning, and program code results, sort of program code. In generative AI, program code does really result, but it's, it's the weights of the neural network. And it can now predict given input data that you have no output data for. This is just your typical machine learning, but 
this is really how all of this works, even generative AI. Instead of pro program code, which can come out, uh, a token is produ predicted. So it's always predicting the next, the next word, which might be part of program code. I created this slide well before generative AI ever kind of blew up with ChatGPT and the others. And I put it last, actually, because I just never had a lot of real-world use for generative AI. But we'll get to that in a moment. This shows kind of the six main areas that you will be using deep learning in. Computer vision certainly is absolutely one of its mainstay. It can detect people in frames. It can tell you what you're looking at. We'll see lots of examples of that as we get into it. Tabular data is where you, you have data that would fit nicely into Excel. Deep learning can absolutely do this. Usually, if you do want to do deep learning with tabular data, you're doing it in conjunction with images or something like that. If you're doing just pure tabular data, the type of data that would fit into Excel nicely, you probably might as well use XGBoost or one of the gradient boosting or more traditional machine learning. Natural language processing, another area that deep, deep learning has really, really taken by storm, the ability to process human language. Reinforcement learning, absolutely a major area for, for deep learning. This is this is used to improve the training of some of these large language models, but it it teaches the neural networks to deal with step-by-step -step processes like video games. And we'll see Atari games were a, a common target of that. And then time series, predicting future things. Everybody wants to predict the stock market. Um, I probably still wouldn't be working if I had figured out how to completely predict the stock market. And then generative AI, where basically it generates entirely new things from the input that it's it's come up with. This can be computer vision. I mean, this can be images, text. It's usually something to something, text to text in the case of ChatGPT, text to image, text to audio, even in the case of, of, of music. This little song that you hear right here I is is actually about my bulldog hickory and I was able to just easily generate this without even thinking about it in AI. Brown and white, strut and tall, country dog with a nose for it all, dreaming about squirrels and a hamburger wish, snoring so loud it's pure canine bliss, he loves a slow ride and a stroller seat. So you'll hear about regression classification and, and also beyond. Regression is when you're predicting a number. Classification is when you're predicting what something is or its class. We'll see both types of neural networks as we go through. And then why, why deep learning? Basically because it can handle just about any type of input, whereas you have to encode these other, for these other machine learning types, you're going to have to encode it into a, a numeric vector, whereas uh, deep learning... There, there is still sort of the vector, but with all of the advances in it, particularly convolution, neural networks, transformers, all of these things, you can just take that, that data in in any form, just about. We will be using Python for deep learning. Python has just taken the world absolutely by storm. TensorFlow and Keras, that's kind of the older one, available from Google. I started teaching this class in TensorFlow, but I just felt it wasn't keeping up really with PyTorch and switched to PyTorch. You're going to get a number of keys, tokens, if you will. Not tokens like what you put into a general um, Gen AI model, but just these hexadecimal sort of strings that you'll use to authenticate yourself. If you're taking this class at WashU and not just watching the videos, then I will send you a homework submission key. First night of class, I'll show you how to make use of that. You'll need to register for a free hugging face key. In this class, you'll get an open AI key because you're not going to use Gen AI a whole lot. But I do want you to at least see how to use these prompts and large language models. Now, if you're making use of Copilot, Colab, like we have here, the advantage of this is it's a whole Python environment. So we can actually run this little bit of code and see the results. So I really do recommend that you use Colab for this course. You can install Python onto your local computer and certainly run it like that. You're, you're going to probably have the easier time unless you're really, really wanting to have that installed locally. 
it'll be better just to run run this. You'll see the output from it. The GPU is available. I am using a GPU. You'll see I am using Colab Pro. You do not need to buy the subscription to it. The free version is perfectly fine. And I tell you what version of some of these libraries we have. And if you are using a Mac, one of the M1 or later, everything in this course is designed to make use of the Apple GPU. And that's probably your easiest path to running a local GPU. It's a little more involved to get the GPU up and running on Windows, but I do have some videos about that. And we'll look at the module one assignment first during our first class session. It'll be primarily WashU students that'll be able to submit and retrieve those. You can certainly look at the uh, assignments, but I only grade those for students of the university. Thank you for watching this video. And if you want to follow along with this course as we go through, definitely subscribe to the channel. And as they say, smash the like button. <laughs>